overcome We will understand it better by and by By and by When the morning comes We will understand it better by and by We will tell the story of how we've overcome We will understand it better by and by Amen, come on, amen, that's right Going home one day, going to understand all of this Father, we come before you this morning We thank you for your love and your mercy, Lord We thank you for bringing us through the night, Lord, just some tremendous weather that uh, God imposed upon us, Lord. We just praise you for your goodness, Lord. Let it be a reflection and let it resonate in our, how, uh, our hearts about how powerful and awesome and unbelievable that you are. And Father, we just look for that in our lives, Lord. We look for that kind of power, that kind of demonstration so that we can live in a manner that pleases you, uh, Lord Jesus, that honors you, dear Father. Uh, and that fulfills your work in our life, dear Holy Spirit, that we can reach out to others around about us, uh, declaring and describing and revealing that power. Lord, just be with us this morning. We need you. We need you. We don't need a lot of singing. We don't need a lot of talking. We don't need a lot of fellowshipping unless you're involved in the midst of it. If you're not Amen. here in the midst of us, Lord, Amen. it will account in a, an amount to nothing. Amen. So, Father, we need your presence here this morning. That's Move right. on each and every one that's come out. Father, just deal in their hearts, deal in their lives, draw them closer to you, build that's them up. Right. We're already blessed. Well, we are already blessed in Christ Jesus with That's all right. things pertaining to life and godliness. Lord, teach us how to get to those blessings. That's what our problem is. Teach us how to get to what we've already received. Well, just have your will and way now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Just, man, just a rough and tumble Sunday morning. Woke up with the power off. The little alarm clock was blinking and flashing. Had some tremendous lightning and thunder last night, which I like that stuff. I mean, I just enjoy all that explosions and carrying on. And it was, a, it was, a, it was impressive, amen? That was some pretty impressive stuff. I mean, got to some uh, groups of lightning coming together and just waiting for all that noise behind it. But, uh, yeah, definitely took, uh, took the power off. So, uh, uh, anyway, I'm I glad for everybody that has been able to make it. Uh, I know we've got some extra rain, more rain. Uh, seems like God's just going to favor us with rain, you know, just over <laughs> and over again. Uh, I want to thank, uh, speaking of rain, I'll thank Brother Wayne, because uh, he rolled in in between the showers and got the churchyard mowed and then, then run over there and mowed my yard, which just... Uh, it's troublesome to me, but anyway, he did it anyhow. So, uh, anyway, I praise the Lord for that. Appreciate that. Uh, we got Mother's Day is coming up next Sunday. Everybody knows that, right? Amen. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. So that's one of the big reasons you come to church. You young people, you young people, all you young people, you listening to me? Next Sunday, Mother's Day. Okay, I'm trying to keep you from getting in trouble. Okay, I'm trying to make sure that you're prepared and ready. Amen. And further, all the rest of you, next Sunday, Mother's Day. Don't forget Mama. And uh, we'll be doing some things here. We've got the youth group's been doing the, uh, 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 the raffle on the Mother's Day basket. And they went out again yesterday, which is why uh, my beautiful bride is at about half, half speed this morning. Uh, she was okay, of course, but she's like the rest of us. So then she was okay. So, oh, I, I've got this now. Oh, I'll be all right. You know, it doesn't matter. I don't get in until 8 p.m. and finally crawl up in the bed. I'll be fine in the morning. Yeah. Anyway, be praying for her, and please pray for me, because I took care of her all week. I don't want to do that again. Amen. I love her, but I don't want to do that again. Amen. All right. So uh, anyway, and then it's Wednesday night. Uh, I've gotten my arm twisted uh, by some people that wanted to have something besides beans and rice. And that just troubles me, because every time we do that, we get into... We just get carried away, and next thing somebody's like, oh, I'll make a roast, and I'll make a turkey, and it's like, no, it's just Wednesday night, you know? We get too carried away, but we're going to try this one time. Uh, uh, we're going to have hot dogs this Wednesday night, hot dogs, and, uh, and I think i uh, got some others who are going to bring some sweet tea and some unsweetened tea and such as that, so we got that going on, so maybe just grab a bag of chips and, and, and come on in for Wednesday night, okay? So we're going we're gonna, to... We're gonna, 
worries me. Amen? Just concerns me. But we're going to get through the hot dog night. It'll be all right. Uh, if you see, once again, I've still got that in there about having your Bible. You have got to have your Bible. Okay? I'm going to keep saying this until we get this. You've got to have your Bible that you're, keep, you're marking things in. You're keeping up with uh, the different times of who preached and what they said. And you're, uh, uh, you know, highlighting things that mean something to you. You've got to have your Bible. Amen? Amen. All right. So I just want to bring that up again. And uh, love everybody. Let's see. What else? Do I have anything else? I don't think I do right now. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. Amen? There's a sign-up sheet in the front where we have the DVD list and the mm -hmm. prayer list. It says beans and rice, but if you're going to bring something for this Wednesday, if you can just put down what you're going to bring so we know who's bringing what so we don't have multiples and nobody brings dogs. So <laughs> just uh, sign it up on your way out, please. And um, y'all can be seated on this song. I tried to pass one out to everybody. I thought we had enough, but I'm kind of glad we didn't. And um, this is going to be our offertorial song. We're going to do a little different today. So um, we just encourage everyone to sing with us and just uh, walk up and bring your offering sometime during the song. Ready when you are, Steve. Oh, well, let, well, let's let the, hold on, let's let them get seated. Where is it? Do you have it? And after the video, we're going to play a video after this song, the kids can get dismissed to Children's Church. If you're in the youth group, you'll be attending service. If you're under 12, you'll be going to the Children's Church. Okay, all right. Just clip it on. Clip it on. Got it? <laughs>
life. You know, the Bible says that the Lord's mercies. I thought you already told them to leave. They didn't leave yet. Where's that? Where's Lolly at? Miss Lolly, come on down here. Get her down here and we'll get these young ones headed to the room. If you're in kindergarten through sixth grade, you know where you're headed. So you can start headed that way and Miss Lolly's coming down right now. She'll meet you there. Amen. Uh, this morning we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. But as I was saying, the point is the Bible says that God's mercies are new and afresh every morning. Every day you start out just like nothing that ever happened previous to that. You step into it just brand new on that new morning. With his mercies new, his mercies fresh, doesn't matter. Whatever happened yesterday, you know what, you know what we can do about what happened yesterday? Nothing. Nothing. It's over with. It's over with. It's done. You know, what's happened thus far in this service, there's nothing we can do about it because it's already done and over with. It's already happened. Amen. And the whole point is that we, we come into each day new and fresh. And listen, that's the, the exciting part is, is that I'm confronted with and wrapped up in, protected by, overshadowed by the mercies of God. Amen. Amen. That he is there for me to watch over me to encourage me to help me it is so good to see uh miss ashley here i mean she just had surgery wednesday okay just had surgery wednesday and and i like people that uh because i know she ain't comfortable but i like people that come to the termination you know what i can hurt at church like i can hurt at the house so whatever you know i just roll up in there and get comfortable in the corner and just watch what goes on amen, amen. that's right that's right so good to see you this morning amen uh, we're going to look here in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And we live in a day and time uh, where nobody talks much about sin. You know, nobody talks much about sin. You know, the, the, the whole concept of right and wrong. It just, you know, nowadays, if you like it, then it's okay. You know, matter of fact, if somebody says something against what you like, they're the ones that are wrong. You know, they're being intolerant. You know, they're not being accepting. You know, but, you know, there's some things in life that are obvious. And it's obvious that some things are right and wrong. Amen? Some things are right. Some things are wrong. Amen? If I walk up to you <clears throat> and give you a cake, that's a right thing. That's a good thing. I walk up to you. Backhand you across the face? That's a wrong thing. Amen? You know, stupid as we come, be like, well, I just like backhanding people, and you shouldn't get on to me because I feel like slapping you with the back of my hand when I come by. You know? You're being intolerant. But you see, now see, that, that's all silly because the fact is we know that there's some right and wrong in all of this. The problem with human beings is we don't realize where it comes from. You know you can do the right thing. You know you can do the wrong thing. You know when you've done the wrong thing. You know, I was with these young ones, I always think about, you know, because I'd get that the report card issue could sometimes be a bad thing. You know what I'm saying? You hadn't perhaps done like you should have done or taken care of what you should have taken care of, uh, especially when I was little, you know. And I knew it. I knew it was coming. I knew I wasn't doing what I needed to do to take care of that. I knew it was going to be bad, but I didn't care at that time. But then when that day came, man, I knew it was wrong and I knew it was fixing to be bad and I knew it wasn't going to be good and I knew it was my fault. And I knew there was nothing I could do with it but deal with the consequences now. Because you know what? Even at that young age, when I'm talking about in elementary school, I knew about right and wrong. I knew what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I knew how you were allowed to talk and how you weren't allowed to talk. I knew what you were, uh, you know, the way you conducted yourself on the playground and how you didn't. There is right and wrong in this world. Now, God takes it and he defines it differently in the scripture and he just takes us to a, a whole other place and he begins to talk about this thing called sin. Sin. Sin is an act of will which transgresses against or is disobedient to divine law. It's when we go against what God says. One thing to go against what a teacher says. Perhaps something else to go against what a parent says. But when we get to that level uh, within ourselves that we think it's okay to go against what God says and to make excuse for that... You know, well, I'm not Jesus. 
I'm only human. You know, we use that stuff way, way too often. We try to cover way, way too much with that. We have issues in life that we could be taken care of that we don't take care of. And then we say, well, I'm only human. Okay. Well, you know what? That doesn't work. It doesn't work for anybody. Because there is right and wrong in this world. So we're going to take a look this morning at sin's unchanging action. Because sin is going to do the same thing it does every time it shows up. So here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to read a story about David and Bathsheba. And it's a very easy story to read. It flows very well and you should just enjoy it. So 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab... And his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Right here. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified for her uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. We're going to stop right there, because I want to get the rest of it as we go along. Father, I come before you right now. I lift up this section of scripture, Lord. I ask for your anointing and your empowering. Let's take a look here uh, in the word of God and see how sin's unchanging action continues to do what it does every time it breaks loose in our life. It's never going to be any different. It's never going to lift us up. It's never going to better us. It's never going to refine us. It's never going to be good for us. It's always going to do the same thing it does. It's going to bring death into the situation. Lord, let us see that clearly this morning. Let's be able to identify those things as they present themselves so that we can avoid them. Lord, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look, when I use the word sin, that's like me using the word car. Okay, I want you to understand that. When I use the word sin, it's like me using the word car. Now, I say car, you get a general picture in your mind, correct? Of a, you know, four-wheeled vehicle that drives you around, such as that. But how many different kind of cars are there? You know, if car is the title, you know, the, the heading, then you come down from that and you just branch off into all these little subheadings. And then below that, you branch off into different models. You've got makes, models, you've got years, you know, this, that, and other. You've got all these different things. So when I'm talking about sin, I want you to understand that sin is the same way. It could be the heading, but underneath that, there's many different things. Matter of fact, I've got six pages of stuff, if you can possibly imagine, that describe what sin is. All the different forms and variations. I'm going to give you a few of them. Uh, Number one, sin just means evil or bad. And that means it's contrary to God's nature. Uh, number two, it means uh, like an offense, like, you've, uh, like you're deserving of punishment. Uh, third one means wicked as, as uh, being morally wrong. Another one means iniquity, which means it's crooked. When you, sh when you should be straight, you ain't being straight, but you're being crooked or twisted about something. Another one's used as transgression. That talks about just straight up rebellion. Uh, another one translated comes out as guilty, which means you're guilty of an offense or a trespass. Another one means to wander out of the way. Another one means to rebel and revolt. Another one means to be uh, enraptured and has the idea of intoxication that you're sinning through ignorance. Another one, do you get what I'm saying? It just goes on and on and on about the different variations of what sin is. It can be rebellion. It can be getting sucked in. It can be not paying close attention. It can be not watching out for what you're doing. It can be willfully just saying, I don't care what God says or what he thinks. I'm going to do what I want. There are so many different variations of this, but the end result of the same is going to bring death into your life. Sin has caused the death of friendships. Because somebody lied about somebody. Somebody was hateful to somebody. Somebody was impolite. Somebody was unkind. Sin has caused death in friendships. You know, in relationships. Sin causes death wherever it shows up. Now I want you to see a few things. So I just want to go through this. And I want you to see this guy David. And I want you to see what happens to him. Okay? Because sin's always going to cause us to lose things. 
Almost all your issues today are caused by sin. Did you know that? Almost all your issues today are caused by sin. Either yours or somebody else's. Did you know that? I want you to think about that. I was impacted when I was growing up by the sins of my parents. By the things they did or didn't do that they should or shouldn't have done, such as that. Do you get what I'm saying? So other people's actions, other people's sin can have impact on you. And what ends up is that almost everything going on in your life tracks back to sin one way or the other. That somebody didn't do what they should have done, didn't do the right thing when they should have done it. And you find yourself in this situation. It doesn't matter if it was you that didn't do the right thing. And trust me, we got our hand in the pot, amen. But I'm saying there can be other people that have done things that they shouldn't have done and those sins were then put upon you. You didn't ask for them. You didn't look for them. You didn't want them. You didn't request them. You didn't deserve them even. But the whole point is that those things were then put upon you. So all of our issues, all the things that that trouble us and hurt us and drag us down, you can track it all back to sin in one or another of its forms or varieties. And you know what the biggest thing is? Is that we all the time act like it's not that important. Well, we all sin. We all fall short. We're all human. We're all not perfect. We're all this, that, and other. Amen? We just don't give it the credibility that it needs to give. I want you to see this morning what happens. I want you to see David in verse 1 here in 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible says it was time for the kings to go out to war. But the Bible says there that David stayed in Jerusalem. So I want you to see the first thing that sin takes from us. Is it'll take your mission. It'll take your righteousness. It'll take your right standing. In other words, it'll move you out of the place you're supposed to be in. Because see, David wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem right now. It was that springtime of the year when the kings went out to battle and there was these confrontations and there's little one-on-one battles and and skirmishes and such as that. And that's where he was supposed to be, involving himself in those things right there. But instead, the Bible says that he was tearing in Jerusalem. So I'm going to submit to you right now that I don't know if Bathsheba had gotten his attention and kept him there or the fact that he stayed there opened him up to the opportunity of seeing her and getting into the situation he was. But somehow he had lost his passion, he had lost his interest, and sin had already impacted him in the fact that he was not where he should be. See, because we lose our mission. We forget our assignment. We forget our task, our job, our duty, our calling, our goal, our purpose that God has given us because you can't do that and busy yourself with doing that which is wrong at the same time. So immediately the king who should have been leading his army is now sitting at the house with nothing to do. That's what happens to us. You got stuff to do. You have things to get accomplished. You know, I don't care if you're, you know, you know what, we, we take and we minimize all these things. You know, they used to say the hand that rocks the cradle uh, controls the world, you know, impacts the world. I mean, if you're a mom, be the best mom you can be, amen? Stay on track with that. It's your calling, it's your duty, it's your responsibility. If you're a dad, be the best dad you can be. If you're in school, do the best you can, learn as much as you can. Trust me, you need that stuff. Now, I'm not saying I just run around using algebra all the time, but you know what? I needed the structure, I needed the learning, I needed to exercise my mind, I needed to create myself into who I needed to be in order to function in this society. You've gotta do those things, so do the best you can. But I'm telling you, when in, in all these things, the goodness that God's given and the direction he takes us, as soon as we get involved in those things that we shouldn't be doing, you know what? All that goes by the wayside, amen? So we see David here just standing when he should have been out with the rest of his army. And it came to pass in verse 2 that uh, at evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. We're going to see him in verse 3. It said, David sent and inquired after the woman. Found out that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers and took her and brought her back to the castle. 
Now, all of this is all of this is going the wrong way. Number one, you know, maybe he stepped out and he saw something he shouldn't have seen, but then he should have stepped back in. But no, then he sends and begins to inquire. So he sees her and he sends unto her and then he sends for her. And we see him in this sin losing his restraint. Okay, his right standing is gone because he's not where he's supposed to be. Now he's losing his restraint because you're there where you should not be seeing what you should not see. Are you getting this? I know that's a little hard to understand, but let me, get, let, me, let me give this to you. As we follow the Lord, I truly believe God puts you where you need to be, when you need to be, around who you need to be around. Amen? So you step out from that and decide to do what you want to do. Then you find yourself someplace you shouldn't be, looking at something you shouldn't see, and getting yourself in a situation that never would have happened if you'd stayed following God in the first place. Amen? Huh? You see... Broken faces, broken places, different places that you never should have laid eyes on to begin with. You, uh, you, you find yourself doing things you never should have done. You find yourself trying things you never should have tried. Because you know what? You weren't where you were supposed to be in the first place. And as soon as you get out there and that right standing is gone now because you're not pursuing him, then your restraint fades. Well, I'm here. Since I'm here and you're here and that's here, let's do that. Because there's nothing to restrain you anymore. Everybody getting that? This is what happens to David. He's not in the right place. He's not where he should be. So then he begins to uh, be confronted with things that he shouldn't be confronted with in the first place. You know what? If he'd been out battling, he'd have never seen a woman naked bathing on top of the roof. Amen? Wouldn't have happened. At least the last time I checked, when you're in military zones, that's not something that takes place very often. Amen? Now, very often do beautiful women come out and just take baths at the military zone, amen? Somebody wake up in here, okay? I'm just trying to say it now. So if he'd been where he's supposed to be in, none of this would have started taking place and none of this would have happened. So his restraint goes. Sin is driving him now. I want you to think about it. Sin is driving him. When's the last time sin drove you? Just popped open the driver's seat, hopped in, adjusted the belt buckle, put the mirror back, kicked you into gear, dropped you into drive, and took you where it wanted to take you. Yeah, because see, who we yield ourselves to becomes, we become their servant. You can become the servant of sin. Sin's in charge, driving you, taking you, pulling you, pushing you, turning left, right, down this road, down that road, over here, over there. Man, you're just giving over to those things because you've yielded yourself to that. This is where David finds himself. He has lost his restraint because he's no longer driving the vehicle now. It's his lust. It's his interest. It's what he's seeing. It's him not being where he should be. All these things are coming into play. And you know what? We act like there's nothing to that. Huh? Go wherever I want to. See whoever I want to. Be however I want to. Yeah, go ahead and try that. That's not how this life works. Amen? You need God to guide you. What, did, what, did the, what does the Lord's Prayer say? Does anybody know? It says, lead me not, what? Into temptation, amen? Don't take me places I don't need to go. God, you know who I am. You know what interests me. You know what intrigues me. You know what overwhelms me. You know what grabs my attention. So, Lord, lead me not into temptation. We, I can go around that. It don't bother me. No, you can't. You never could. You never will be able to. It ain't going to work for you. Just trust God to lead you where you need to be, when you need to be there, so you don't get tempted in the first place and end up in the situation we're fixing to see this guy end up in. And this is the king, the leader of the country. The God has chosen and anointed and put him in this position. And yet, here he is, not where he's supposed to be, seeing things he shouldn't see, losing his restraint, calls this woman in who belongs to another, so he's going to commit adultery and direct, uh, and direct violation to the scripture, to the commandments he's been given. And here comes, here comes, you ready? Because you think you're going to ease in and ease out. You think you're going to do it and not get caught. You think you're going to just have your moment and then sneak home. Nobody's ever going to know, amen? That's how we do that stuff, right? I'm going to get this done. Ain't nobody going to know, man. I'll get back home. Ooh, come in just sweating. You know what? Then the phone rings. Verse 5, the woman calls up and says, hey, by the way, I got pregnant that night. Well, now that changes everything, doesn't it? Now what? See? We always end up on the hook. You can't do wrong and get by. 
You can't do wrong and get by. I want you to think about that. You say, well, I've done things wrong, didn't get caught. Yeah, but you didn't get by. Because whatever you were supposed to be doing at the time, you were doing something else you missed out on, so you lacked that in your person right now, so you didn't get by. You just missed out on what you should have been getting in the first place because you were busy doing something you shouldn't have been doing. You can't do wrong and get by. Where you're at is where you are. You need to be present where you are and where you're at, listening to what's going on at that point in time as God leads you and brings you. You know what? Everybody in here, do you know you're here because God wants you here? You understand that? Now, you think you want you here, okay? But I'm telling you, God wants you here. That's why you're here. He is sovereign. He is in charge. He is in authority. He is the one that made you think this is a good place to come and brought you in here and brings you in here time after time. So you are sitting right now where God wants you to be sitting. No question about it because apart from him, you wouldn't come here. Amen? Everybody say amen. Apart from God, you wouldn't come here. I didn't go to church before I got saved. Amen? Because I had no reason to go to church. Until God got a hold of my heart and things became different. So now he's bringing me in here. And however you've ended up here this morning, you're supposed to be here. So the point is to be present where we are and, and, and understand that no matter what, we can't get by if we don't engage ourselves in the situation we're in. David thinks he's going to slip in, slip out. No big deal. Uriah, listen, Uriah's out there fighting for the nation while the king's at home sleeping with his wife. This is starting to sound like some kind of soap opera or one of them 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock shows on on, on Fox or something, amen? But this is what's going on back at the house. But she ends up pregnant. So now what? You know what he's going to do? He's going to get just as stupid as you do when you get in those binds, amen? Come on, somebody say amen. Good night. You've been in those binds before and you're sitting there, you're thinking of the dumbest stuff. You're trying to think of some way to get out of this and you go, well, I could do this and I could do that and what I'll do and I'll spin it like that and I'll, I'll tell half but not all of it. Amen. You know, I'll take a little lick here, but I'm not going to own the whole thing. Amen. It's not going to all be my fault. It'd be somebody else's fault. You know, you just got this thing going and you become an idiot. Amen. Everybody say amen. Huh? And you'd be telling that to people and people are looking at you like you're an idiot because what you're telling is not believable. Huh? Y'all ever been there? Don't put your hands up. Huh? Y'all ever had somebody do that to you? You've seen them people come up and tell you stuff, and you're like, ain't no stinking way. And the timeline don't work. There's no way you could have been seven places at one time like you saying you was. But I know they weren't there. They were here because I talked to them on the phone. They were, well, I was on Facebook with them, and you say, you know, and just nothing works about it. But you know, oh, yeah, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Well, David's fixing to get just that dumb. So he gets the word that she's pregnant. What does he do? Look at verse 6. Now we're going on. David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And then David says to Uriah in verse 8, he says, Go down to thy house and wash your feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Okay, so do you get what David's doing here? David sends out to the battle, sends, says, Send Uriah the Hittite to me. When Uriah gets there, David sits him down like he's interviewing him about how the war's going, you know, and says, how's everything been? How's everything? How's the battle going? Everything going okay? Y'all got plenty of food? You got all the arm, uh, armaments you need? Blah, 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 blah. Having this whole day. Just playing this game. Y'all see this game, right? Then he says, well, since you're in town, go on to the house and get cleaned up and enjoy the night with your wife. Hmm, why is he doing that? Because he's trying to cover up what he did. He said, if I get Uriah in there and they sleep together, then he'll think it was his kid and not my kid. Okay, now, I don't know what kind of three-day pregnancy test they had back then, but I'm thinking by the time she realizes she's pregnant and word gets to him and Uriah gets from there to there, that you're a little bit behind the eight ball by that time, Amen. You're probably a little out of the range of saying that that one was his. So, but this is David's plan. I'll get him to go in there and I'll say, oh, well, praise God, y'all had a baby. Amen. That's good. Wonderful for you. 
Now, wait a minute. Now, hang on a minute. If he could have pulled that off, would that plan have worked? Do you believe if he'd have pulled that off that you wouldn't be reading somewhere down the line about this child that belonged to David that was born to Bathsheba, growing up in Uriah's house? Somewhere down the line, this would have come up again. He wouldn't have just got, a, got away with it. Amen? That'd been a no solution situation. God ain't allowing stuff like that to happen, especially for those that are his and that are the king. And so there's no way he's getting by with this. He says, go home, wash your feet, spend some time with your wife, enjoy the evening. Then he sends him a bunch of meat so he can have a big barbecue. He says, have a barbecue, relax, enjoy yourself. It says in verse 9, look here, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. And when they told David, saying Uriah went, didn't go, they said Uriah didn't go home. Went not down to his house. David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from the journey? Why didn't you go down into your house? He said, You came from battling out there and you took that long journey and I, I sent food for the barbecue. Why didn't you go to the house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark in Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. He said, everybody else is out missing their family. Everybody else is out defending the country. The Ark of the Covenant's out there. My commander Joab's out there. He said, I'll not go into the house. He said, I'm not going to come back and enjoy all those pleasantries and all that niceness while everybody else does without. He said, I'll sleep right here at the front door of the castle, at the, you know, at the front door here at your place. He said, but I'm not going to my house. That's an honorable dude, isn't it? Huh? I mean, the king's telling you. He's like, no, I ain't going to do it. So look, verse 12, and David said to Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And David gets him drunk, it says, and made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to his house. He said, I'll get him drunk and send him home, and he won't know whether he did or didn't or what happened. But still yet, even drunk, Uriah goes outside and just plops down there with everybody else and won't go to his house. Now, wait a minute, you say, that's just crazy. Now, he's like, he's having no success with plan one, amen? So he's going to go to plan two. Are you ready? So plan two... And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set you Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire you from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of that city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people, the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. But he says, Since you won't go home, and have relations with your wife where I can cover up my sin since you are too honorable for that. I can't get you drunk and get you home. He said, here, take this letter to Joab. Now imagine this. I want you guys to get this. This always just blows my mind. So Uriah is now carrying his death sentence in his hand. He's the one toting the letter back. Has the king's seal on it. He is holding his own death sentence in his hand. Does not break the seal, does not look, does not hold it up to the light to see what it says. Because he's an honorable man and he's carrying this letter back to Joab. And he hands it to Joab and Joab puts him out in the front and they pull back. And I want you to see this. Uriah dies, but it's not just him. It says in verse 17 that some of the people of the servants of David, there fell some of the people of the servants of David. So in order to get Uriah killed, they had to be willing to sacrifice some other people and get them killed so that Uriah would end up dead. Listen, I want you to understand something. This is pretty bad stuff. You understand me? 
Man sleeps with another man's wife, even though he is the king, brings him in, tries to get him to cover it up by sending him home uh, to, to have relations with her so he can say that it's his child. He's too honorable to do that. Can't even get him drunk in doing that. So then he writes a letter to the one in charge back at the battlefield and says, get him out front and then pull back from him. So he ends up getting killed. And in doing so, not only does he get killed, but some other guys get killed. This is not a very good guy, is it? But this is King David. I mean, this is the man in the Old Testament, King David. He's the one that said it. he's the apple of God's eye. He's the, he's the beloved king. He's the one, the seventh son of Jesse that was picked out to take Saul's place. So let's go on, 18. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. He tells him about all this, and I just want to drop down just for time's sake. He tells them all that happened. Verse 24 says, And the shooters uh, shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Okay, so Joab sends him a message back, tells him it's done. Uriah's dead. He lost some other guys along with him, but he's dead also. Listen to this. Okay, I told you David has lost his right standing. He's not where he's supposed to be, not doing what he's supposed to do. In doing that, he's lost his restraint. Along with that, now he's lost his reason. Thinks he's going to cover all this stuff up and get by with this somehow. He's just scratching, you know, grasping at straws, however you want to work, however you want to work it. Now listen to this king, this guy that, 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 that's a godly man that supposedly loved God. And listen to him lose his remorse. Verse 25, then David said unto the messenger, thus shalt thou say unto Joab, let not this thing displease thee. For the sword devours one as well as another. You know what he's saying? He said, ah, in a war people die. Think about that. No remorse. He says, well, you know what? In wars people die. What about the other? I mean, okay. The Uriah situation is bad enough, but what about the other little kids that are left without a dad? The other wives that are left without a husband? The other men that got killed too, and for David to say, well, you know what? In a war, people die. Don't let it bother you. See, because sin takes away our remorse. All we're interested in is what we get out of the situation. And look, he don't slow up a bit. He said, the sword devours one as well as the other. Uh, make thy battle more strong against the city. Overthrow it and encourage them. And when the wife of Uriah the, uh, heard that her, Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house and she became his wife and bare him a son. Didn't slack up, didn't slow down a bit, not a bit of remorse. He has lost his right standing, he has lost his restraint, he has lost his reason, he has lost his remorse. And now he's gotten Uriah out of the way and he waits for the little mourning period to pass and he just reaches out, gets Bathsheba and brings her to the castle, brings her to the house. As if. Now, let me ask you something. Is this going to work out for him? How does everybody know that? Everybody knows that. Everybody's like, no, no, not going to work. You know what? I mean, even though I know some of you that's been preached to you plenty of times, but I mean, the other ones that, man, they ain't heard anybody like, no, huh, that ain't going to work. God ain't like that. God don't play like that. Listen right there, verse 27. This is what we need to be concerned with. The end of verse 27, it says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I want everybody in this room to understand something. This is where your issues lie. Is what you're doing pleasing to the Lord or displeasing to him? Now, David went a long way in 26 verses. From not being where he should be to seeing what he shouldn't see to not restraining himself. Now we got people dead so that he could have the woman he wanted. The Bible says this thing that he did displeased the Lord. It's all sin. It's all sin. And there has to be a revealing of that. And I want you to listen this morning. So you go to chapter 12 and it's Nathan the prophet shows up and he tells David this story. I want you to hear this story with me. It said in verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and one, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nursed up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It didn't eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. 
<clears throat> and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. <clears throat> and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the traveling man or the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. He says, you got this rich guy that's got everything. He says, you got this poor guy that's got but one thing. He said, and this traveler comes in, and instead of the rich guy taking one of his many flocks, he takes that one lamb from the poor guy, the only thing that guy has, and offers it up. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because, and because he had no pity. Nathan looks at him and says, I'm talking about you. He says, Uriah had but his wife. He says, you're the king that has everything. But when it came upon you, you decided you would take the one thing that he did have. And then on top of that, you would take his life under yourself. He says, you're just like the guy in the story. You're just like the guy in the story. You act like it's okay for you to take from somebody else that which does not belong to you. And he goes on and says, you are the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. Gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. He said, if that wasn't enough for you, David, all you had to do was ask and I'd have given you more stuff. But you decide you can just take. He says, wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. People are dead. Wounds without husband. Brought into the king's castle. Now she's pregnant. Bears David a son. All this is going on. And you know what? He's the king. It's happening in front of everybody. Everybody's seeing this conduct. Nobody's missing this. And you know what? That's something else you need to know too. Okay? Ain't nothing you doing that don't everybody know about. Seriously. You, maybe a little. But we live in a day and time where you can't get by with nothing. Somebody done seen your vehicle, seen you. Put it on Facebook, put it here, put it there, put it on Instagram, Snapchat, something like that. I mean, you can't get by with nothing anymore. David thinks he's getting by with all this. The whole country knows what's going on. Everybody knows what's happened. The whole nation is looking at the king like he's absolutely lost his mind. So finally... God has to give a revealing, and that's what I hope this morning, for anybody in here this morning, God gives you a revealing of how dangerous this sin is, because you know what? You'll lose your right standing, you lose your restraint, you lose your reason, you lose your remorse, and you know what? Well, suddenly we don't care if we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, it doesn't make any difference to us anymore, because we get hardened with sin, and where have tender-hearted people gone, amen? Where have tender-hearted people gone that care whether it's right or wrong? There has to be a revealing and God comes in with this prophet Nathan and does this revealing to David and says, you know what? You have been horrible. You have killed people. You have taken that which didn't belong to you. And then he tells him, listen, there's a revealing. He brings this reality. And listen to me, when there's sin involved, there's always going to be repercussions. Within that sin is the punishment for it. Amen. It's in there. It's already in there. You can't separate the two. If you do it and it's wrong, it's going to come back and get you. And immediately right here, he said in verse 10, he says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives from before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Go down to verse 15, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. I want you to get this here. And you're gonna, if you read these next verses, you'll see David praying and fasting and going through all these things on behalf of that child. But he didn't care when Uriah died. He didn't care when the other men 
died so that Uriah could die. But now he cares about this baby dying. See, there's death involved. Death that you care about. Death that you don't care about. You know, things you don't care about don't impact you that much. But God's bringing this thing home and he strikes the baby and the baby does end up passing away. And you know what? If you read through this, two chapters later, David's son Absalom, or three chapters later, is rising up against his father, sends him out, kicks him out of the castle, and sends him on the run. Amen? From that time on, it is one problem after another problem after another problem after another situation in David's life and in his family over and over and over. And you know what your preacher wrote on this right here? I was talking to you guys about writing in your Bible. I said, speaking of God, did I dismiss his warnings and words? Have I brought into my family that which is bad? Listen to me, guys. You're the head of your house. Don't you dare bring into your family that which is bad. Don't you dismiss what the word of God says. Don't you dismiss what's right and wrong. You make sure you bring into your house that which is good. You know what? I don't want the sword brought into my house. I don't want evil to rise up against me out of my house. I don't want to see death and destruction in my family. Do you? Anybody in here want to see death and destruction in your family? Then make sure you don't bring bad into the house. Make sure you're bringing good into the house. Make sure that we're doing the right thing. Because David's sin here impacted his whole family. His son Absalom ends up dead. Another son ends up assaulting, sexually assaulting one of his half-sisters. All sorts of things go wrong. I mean, it makes life in Louisiana look reasonable. Amen. I mean, it just goes that bad because of this sin being allowed in. Guys, you are set there to protect your family. You have got to do the right thing. Amen. Don't let bad into your family because it's not just about, you know what, we think well, it's just about me. I can take it. I can handle it. Yeah, are you going to sit there and watch your wife handle it? Are you going to watch your children handle it? Things that you brought into their lives, things that you brought into their, uh, into, their, into their hearts and into their minds and things that you exposed them to, God forbid, amen? Let's start doing the right thing. I mean, today is the next day, you know, the first day of the rest of our lives. And we can start doing things different and making sure we're keeping everybody safe and secure like we ought to be. If you got sin in your life, get rid of it. Stop it. Quit it. Well, Eugene, I'm going to get you to head upstairs for me real quick. I'm going to give you guys this last thought. You know what, you know what we're like? We're always praying God will get rid of the cobwebs. You know that? Well, God will do Sweep us out. Clean us out. All them cobwebs. You know what the problem is? One guy was up there praying that one time. Up at the altar, praying that God just, just get the cobwebs out of my life. Preacher's kneeling next to him. You know what the preacher said? He said, no, Lord. He said, kill the spider. Kill the spider. This morning in your life, kill the spider. Kill that which is building that which isn't good in your life. Kill that which is, you know, putting those things up that need to be torn down there. And you know they need to be torn down. That's why you want them swept out of there. Amen? He said, kill the spider. What do you have going on in your life that's not acceptable to God? Do you know that's not right? That doesn't line up with Scripture? You know what? I don't even care if it impacts you or not. Maybe it doesn't impress you that much. Who cares if it impresses you? You ain't that important to sit around in judgment knowing whether it's right or wrong anyway. Amen? There are a lot of things that God says that just, I'm like, okay, you know, but it's just because he says it, not because it offends me or I find it offensive or I think it's wrong within myself. It's just a simple fact that he said it was wrong. I don't have to agree in my heart with what he says for to do what he says, amen? And that's our problem. We've quit letting him be the final word and we put ourselves in that. Well, that doesn't really bother me that much, so I'll keep doing this and I'll keep doing that. And I won't take care of this and I won't take care of that. And I won't clear this up and I won't resolve this issue. I'll continue to allow these things to go on and on and on and on. And every once in a while when it gets really bad, I'll sweep up all those cobwebs. And we wonder why we don't have victory. 
Let's stand this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Kill the spider. What spiders you got running around your life? Things that aren't right. Things that need to change. Things that need to be different. Brother Eugene, if you give us a little music there. Things that need to take place. Things you need to get to doing. Things that you aren't doing. Things that you shouldn't be doing. Don't you bring, guys, don't you bring damage into your family. Don't you bring damage into your life. You got things that need to go, get rid of it. Altars are open. Kill the spider.